You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Welcome back to Experiencing Data. I'm happy to share my recording with Dr. Puneet Batra. He's a very intelligent data scientist that I recently met. And we're going to talk about how data scientists can work better with businesses, both product management, design groups, and business stakeholders, as well as subject matter experts, and vice versa. How can those roles leverage the data scientists and, and their abilities? There's some really great stuff in this recording about fitting your model to the actual business problem, including when it might make sense to actually use a less accurate model if you're doing machine learning or predictive analytics to actually increase user engagement. I hope you enjoy this discussion I had with Puneet. Hi, Puneet. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm excited to uh, have you on the show. So uh, today we're going to be talking to uh, Dr. Puneet Batra, who is a data scientist that I was recently introduced to. We're actually both located here in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. And we actually have some uh, other connections of some companies we worked with together. You were a chief data scientist at Kairos in the past. I, I know you were, you've been working on a, a startup called Level Trigger out of uh, Cambridge as well. Prior to that, you did some work with uh, CERN's Large Hadron Collider. Is that correct? Do you have a physics background? Yeah, that's right. I was chief data scientist at Kairos. I think maybe you were there a little bit after after me, but one of our colleagues put us together for one of the projects that we'll get to. Originally, I was a particle physicist. So I was a theorist and I was doing a postdoc at Columbia. So kind of thinking about new models of physics that experimentalists might discover at experimental facilities like CERN. And I got bitten by the, the data bug and made the jump over to the data science world. Nice. How long ago was that? That was now uh, almost a decade ago. So I guess that was 2009-ish. Cool. So one of the interesting things that brought us together was actually music. And a friend of mine had told me that, oh, I know this, I know this guy named Puneet who's very interested in, in jazz music and predictive analytics and we're predicting uh, music. Can you, can you give people an introduction about what bits your bug or like what? Where, where is this interest in music coming from? And what is this little side project that you have going on with music? Tell us about it. It's still nascent. And after some of our conversations, I'm a little hesitant to trumpet it too much. But I've always loved music. I think like lots of people, music has always been there for me. I've been obsessed with it, get obsessed with songs, etc. And a little while ago, as I started to get deeper into ML and machine learning and, and AI, whatever, side of the fence you, you want to call it, it started to, I started to research what people were doing with having computers generate audio online and using machine learning techniques. So, you know, you can go online and you can find examples of concerts, symphonies, various recordings at various stages that people have made. And it seemed to me that given some of the, the techniques that have been developed in the last few years, specifically around deep learning, that now was a good time to get a little deeper into that and to see what kind of damage I could do. I think that the question for me is maybe we both fall in the same line. I'm not really sure what creativity is. I'm not really sure if machines will ever be creative. And a good experiment to try to prove that out is to try to get a machine to be as creative as possible and see where it falls flat. It just sounded like a great way to get deeper into some of the algorithms I was interested in getting deeper in, as well as sort of you know, hit this problem of creativity right in the nose. So to give people like a little bit more background, you come to me and, and, a, and a colleague, a former roommate of yours, if I recall, at Harvard, who uh, teaches at Berkeley College of Music. And my understanding at the gut of this was like, could a system predict uh, a small piece of music based on Fed recordings? So if the, your, your learning data was uh, a bunch of recordings, and a bunch of songs from what we call the real book in the music world, which is basically a catalog of lead sheets of uh, well-known jazz songs that are played. You know, if you go see a jazz trio or a quartet or something like that, they'll, they'll often be playing music out of this book, which is more of a guidebook than it is like, it's not an orchestral score with everything written out. It's a collection of, 
of melodies and chord symbols that form the basis of the IP of songs. And so you had an interest to see whether or not uh, a machine could effectively generate the correct, predict the correct a slice of music. And that's kind of something you're, you're experimenting with. Is that, is that kind of like the right way to summarize it? Yeah, I, I think that's too generous for, for where I was at the time when you and I first had our conversation. I remember <laughs> a okay. big thing coming out of that conversation was the realization that there is this sort of base, baseline layer called the real book and that bands and jazz bands, you could, as you said, you could put together four musicians and give them the same real book and they'll probably start producing something pretty good right off the, the top of their heads together as a band. So. You know, I think at the time, so this was, uh, Wayne is my, my friend who I often go to whenever I have any dumb questions about music. You know, we were, we were thinking about, well, what would be an interesting test to see how well an AI could do to build music? We started circling around jazz as being something we, we both liked a lot and was, was pretty interesting. And if you could do that, it would be pretty powerful. But then in the conversation the three of us had, you know, I think the, the form of the experiment started to take place, namely input the real book, train it on a bunch of different bands that are playing a version of that real book, and then see if you've encapsulated something so that if you could input a new real book composition, you'd get something that could be, that you could reasonably say was, sounded like the interpretation one of those bands would have made. So kind of a, a big task, but at least something we could then start breaking into, into smaller pieces. You know, at some point, perhaps if this goes somewhere, we'll, we'll have you back on the show. And, and as, as listeners on the show know, occasionally I like to intersperse, uh, you know, music related projects that are going on in kind of the data space. And, and so this is something that's on the horizon. But the thing I was interested in is like part, partly is the process and the fact that you about how you go about doing that. In this case, you're exploring a personal interest. You're not necessarily trying to create a product or a data product or something like that. But what made me want to have you in the show is partly the thinking process and the fact that you... I remember the first time we met, we had a beer together and you're like, you know, I find it's, it's really critical to get stakeholders and subject matter experts involved early to help me, you know, shape the models I'm going to use and the technologies. And so that's what I thought would kind of make this, this conversation interesting. Not just so much that music project, but your background and, and how you look at your customer, your internal customer, and also kind of the end user. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about how you ground your technical knowledge into things? <laughs> how do you ground that such that you, you know you're going to be providing some type of, uh, you know, useful business output? You know, there's a lot of talk in the market about like, you know, the executives, the things I hear, you know, from business leaders is that, oh, all my PhDs and the data people, they just want to, you know, work on the math and, and they just, they're focused on model quality and, and they want to publish their research, you know, and they think they're there to do research and the business thinks they're there to generate some type of business value. And at the same time, there's, there's somewhat of a lab, there's a lab like environment that's happening with some of this, right? Which is maybe we don't know what we can predict yet. Maybe, maybe this is experimental. So, Talk to me about your process of getting end users and, and stakeholders and subject matter experts involved in, in the process of creating a useful piece of output, whatever that may be. Happy to discuss that. And I think it's important to say that by no stretch do I think I have any of that figured out. I think there's just a <laughs> lot of painful lessons that I've learned in the past of things not to do. And, and one of the good ones is to talk to real experts as quickly as possible. One of the things that I've noticed, so you know, I've worked in a lot of B2B startups trying to take data to market in various ways. One of the things I've noticed is that there's a workflow involved. So there's a real end user. So in healthcare, it might be the doctor or it might be somebody processing a, a healthcare claims in at the startup we're just winding down level trigger. The the end user was somebody working at a large restaurant chain who might be trying to make performance optimization decisions or somebody in a real estate office who's trying to decide which business is best suited for this open spot that they have a vacancy for. Anyway, at the end of the day, there's always somebody who is trying to do their job. What I found as a data person is it is really fun to not think about that person and just ask, what does the data say? If I were going to recreate this whole business ecosystem, What's the most interesting problem to solve? 
I've almost always found that while that's fun, it doesn't lead to anything an end user actually cares about. <laughs> They're usually involved with something that's really, that might not be incredibly sexy. It might just be like a basic piece of workflow that they have to get through a hundred times a day. And if you could make that easy for them, they would be really grateful and you would increase their productivity and, and make the world a better place. So without knowing that, I find it's easy to spend a lot of time solving a science problem that might not be very useful. And so if you can get those people in the door sooner and sort of become a little bit more of a domain workflow expert, you're more likely to be able to find something that's really valuable. So I think that's just another way of saying is that people that have solved a problem for decades have a lot of really valuable experience and you're better off starting with that experience as opposed to ignoring it. You touched on some good things, right? Because a lot, for when we talk about and, you know, data products, at least on this show, we're often talking about decision support tools, right? And ultimately, you're trying to help support some decision that needs to be made. And so the data itself isn't so much like what it's about. It's really about whether or not you facilitated some decision that's going to be made on the other end. Exactly. And obviously the data enables that, but you have to be aware of how people are going to potentially make those decisions so you can align your, your work accordingly. Like, where do you, do you think that's the data scientist's job to do? Like, there's obviously a lot of crossover here with what user experience and design does and understanding, you know, having empathy for, for users and understanding what their habits are and their workflows and all this, like not to say that you have to pigeonhole everything into a job title, but do you think that's the role of the data scientist? Do you think that's a product management thing? Like how, if you were to like slide into a new company and, and you know that you like to build your products this way, do you think that's a data scientist responsibility, like a core thing? Or do you think it's more something to be aware of and you're kind of participating on the side with that? Like, where does that responsibility fall to kind of keep that in check, that workflow? It's a good question. And I think the answer to it depends a lot on the specific problem and how mature the company is in its approach to solving that problem. I mean, if it's, if it's a big company already, they've got great product managers, they've got great user experience people, they've already got a workflow that they're trying to augment with some kind of data problem, then it's just a matter of collaborating with the right people and, and being open and influencing as much as you can that you get information from those sources that can be useful for the, for the data science part of it. If it's a much earlier product, or maybe a product doesn't even exist, or maybe it's this kooky music generation idea, then you know, part of the fun is being able to talk to people that are experts directly and, and recognizing that you're probably not going to do as good a job listening as a real product manager would do or a real user experience or a real design person would do. But you've got to wear a lot of those hats too if you're going to make progress. As I've written to my list before, I, I'm definitely in the camp of good enough, especially when it comes to doing research, because so much of doing good research is, is simply asking good questions and then stop talking and, and listen. It's one of the nice things in tech where you could suck at it, you could get started and totally suck at it and just get better, but you're, you're still likely going to get a ton of value out of it, even if you think you can't do it or you don't know what to do. You're, you're worked up about, oh, what's the psychology and how are you supposed to do the interview and all this kind of stuff. You can get a lot of value out of it just jumping in. You, you don't need, there's not a high learning curve there. So I fully support data scientists, engineers, especially technical people getting involved with that process. That's right. If they can be facilitated by people that really know what they're doing, all the better. Right. Even data scientists and engineers should be able to listen with empathy and, and ask questions. And I, you know, I got a good, good number of tips from people teaching me how to do things like that. Like basically what you said, ask your question and basically shut up and, and hear them and hear what their answer is. I've also found it really helpful to sort of summarize what I've heard and repeat that back to them to see if that captures what they've said. And then Lots of asking open-ended questions at the end. Is there anything that I've forgotten? Is there anything that you really think is important? You know, I think if you're an early product and you're looking for something important, you'll hear it if it's there. And if, it, if you don't hear it, then the question is, are you willing to listen to that? That There isn't something interesting there too. That's a, that's a hard thing to face, but when you've also got to be open to it. So that kind of leads into my next thing. So we just talked about kind of being good, being good enough with your, your user research, that your the activities that you're going to perform and not getting lost in being perfect. Can you talk to me about that in the data scientist briefly in the, in the world of data science about models being good enough versus good, especially from 
a business perspective? Like, is there also a similar thing over there or, or like talk and talk to me about that? Yeah. I th- I, and I think it's, it's uh, agile works there too. And there's a bunch of folks that are, that are experts at applying agile to the data ingest modeling surfacing part of it too. I think there's a little bit of a different flavor there as well. So one flavor I think is, is probably easier to understand, which is, Hey, if you're trying to produce an outcome and an 80% accurate outcome would change somebody's life, then by all means, that, you know, call that good enough, ship it, test it, make sure you've really got it right, and then agilely improve that as you go along. I think what's more, the area that I see is generally harder to grok and wrap your heads around, wrap my head around, is sometimes you don't even know what the right question to ask is. You might have some indication of interesting questions, interesting inputs into end user workflows. You might have some indication of interesting data sets that you could use to tackle those, but they're never going to be perfectly aligned. And what I've always found is you try to connect the dots with a good enough model. Don't throw you know, the kitchen sink at the problem to start with. Throw something in there that's enough to give you an idea if you've got some traction. Because when you do that, when you produce your first outcome, you'll learn things like, was this really the right question to be asking? Is this really the right way to measure success? Success might not be whether you get every individual recommendation right. It might be an overall sense of we're helping move the ship in the right direction. So I generally find you want to connect your data to the question you think is most interesting to, to answer as quickly as possible surface that and then have some hard questions about whether that's an interesting answer, whether there's different data you should be bringing in, whether there's different questions you should be even be asking, but that's when you really want to get everybody to the table. It's, I, I find it's a very much a, a feedback loop there. The question you, you think you're answering from the beginning probably isn't the one that you're going to stay answering the entire time, and you've just got to be flexible around that. Is there a tendency to, you know, your business or if you're, you know, if you're doing consulting work, your client to want to use whatever the problem is that you figured out you could actually solve with the data, even if it wasn't what was originally like, oh, we did some research, we found out there's a, there's a market need for X. The model actually gives you Y or V or (laughs) something a little bit different. It's close to X, but it's really not that. But no one, you know, people don't want to lose the investment. Is there a temptation to want to try to productize whatever was created because the technology seems like it's good? Like, oh, we were, the board said we're supposed to, we need to have an to AI, do AI these days. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, so we just <laughs> spent all this time doing AI and it turns out the answer to the question we want, we can't really answer very well. So let's, let's, say, let's say you find out. Let's say you, you, the board is really asking for an AI-driven solution to something. You bring a team together, you solve a problem, and the answers just aren't that great. Okay, so what do you do? You can you can double down. You might have the wrong algorithm. You should try others. You might need different data sources. Your data might not be clean enough. There's there's a million ways that you can improve your answer. And I think it's an important part of the process to be able to figure out how much additional rope you have in each of those directions. And then eventually it becomes a business decision like, hey, you know, we answered this question. It's at 90% accuracy. We really need it to be at 95% accuracy before we can release it. And given these tests, we think that's going to take six months and acquiring this data set. So that's one possible outcome. And I think a good data scientist will, will have a lot of intuition to be able to collect the data to give you that framework. And then another thing is, we we're only able to answer question X to 90%, but hey, question Y has never been answered before, and we think we've got an 85% answer to that. Business, is that interesting to you? And then I think that's a, that's a question for the business side. It can be refined. You know, It's just one of the tendencies to stick your head in the sand and to get the best answer you could possibly get, even at the point where maybe that's not the question to be asking anymore. So I think that's good organizations have enough collaboration where people are comfortable surfacing early enough results as works in progress where everybody can have an honest conversation about whether this is the right thing to work on or if they should shift gears a little bit or if they need to bring in additional resources to get across the the finish line. 
Do you know ahead of time, like before you jump into doing technical work, like if you have a fairly good, like, I know we're storing this data. I know there's an API to get whatever, some geo data that we need for this thing. Is there a way to get ahead of this such that we don't expend as much technical effort on something where you have a gut feeling that it's not so much a technical problem, but what we can solve with this data is not going to be the X. It's probably going to be the Y. We can jump in and see how good we get at Y, but it's probably not going to be X. Is there a way to get to that sooner such that it doesn't require doing a large implementation project just to arrive at that? Because I'm sure the business, I mean, it's nice for the business here. Well, we couldn't do X, but we did come up with this other thing. Is that useful? It's probably not the best answer that they want to hear. And I totally realize that can happen. But how do we get ahead of that? Like, do you think more research can be done? Like, I don't know. Like, to me, my design hat would say, like, we, you know, what if you get the people that know this data really well with designers or researchers to go out and spend more time kind of understanding the problem space, the customers, and such that maybe the data scientists can then predict earlier, not literally predict with tech, but in their head, they'll have a better sense of like what might be worth investing in. I don't know, any comments? As a data scientist, you always sort of have a, a gut feel for whether this data will solve that problem. I think it's really helpful, and I've seen this be very successful in orgs. And there's often a lot of people that have already solved problems like that, maybe even exactly before. And if you can talk to them about what they did, where you're likely to hit roadblocks, you know, that can really help a lot. The other way is to set it up, I think, a little bit the way really great agile designers and product people set it up, which is there's no reason why you can't do a quick mock-up. Put that in front of some stakeholders and see what they say. So on the data side, that's still a little more involved. But, you know, before you bring out the big guns and, you know, make a 15-layer CNN that has a integration with the a recurrent neural network in it to, to solve X, Y, or Z, you could just try a pretty simple regression model, you know, try a linear regression on a very limited set of data, see if it gives you something interesting. And then in the same way that I think a good agile product designer or UI designer would roll out features incrementally, get lots of good feedback, you can start increasing the complexity of your analysis. And you expect to see given a lot of experience, I expect to see models improve rapidly when I add new data sets or I go to the algorithm that I think is really well suited to this compared to one that isn't. And if I don't see that, that's a sign that there's, that there's something off. You're listening to Experiencing Data, the podcast that explores how design and user experience make enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. Your host is Brian O'Neill of Designing for Analytics, designer, UX consultant, and advisor to the business leaders behind custom enterprise data products and analytics applications. For more information, visit designingforanalytics.com. If you're enjoying the show, help Brian out by rating it on iTunes. And now, back to Brian. Do you have a concept for what an MVP is then in terms of, like, I mean, maybe you've kind of described it already, but I, I guess what I would be wondering if I was like maybe a business stakeholder is like, okay, I know what an MVP of a product, a, a UI looks like. I know it's maybe it's not going to be super nice looking or it's not going to have all the functions in it. Maybe all it does is like, it's a table, you can sort it and filter it and there's a detail view, but there's no workflow or anything, but at least we're, you know, we're showing the data and you can add and edit stuff and you know, create, read, update, delete, kind of something like that. I wonder what that equivalent is on your side, especially if the, is the improvement only in the model and the quality of like, if you're doing predictive analytics or something like that, it's primarily in the model quality or is there a, is there a broader like MVP definition that you think about and in terms of what that increment looks like? You know, I'm just going to riff off of this. I don't think I have the answer and there's probably more, you know, there's, there's folks that are really invested in bringing AI in a very agile way to, to organizations. But in my experience, you know, you can usually tell pretty quickly if some data is going to be suited to answering a question. You can do that sometimes just by looking at subsamples in Excel and visualizations. You can get a sense of whether, you know, there are certain, if you're looking to determine if this is a cat or a dog, right, you can take a look at some pictures and you can ask yourself, like, could I tell if this is a cat or a dog? If you can't, you know, then 
you're likely going to have some trouble. So there's ways of getting people and domain experts to come in to tell you, hey, yeah, if I took a look at this data, I would certainly be able to conclude on the basis of this whether the outcome I want is in there or not. So that's one way to do sort of like a very shallow, quick MVP. Hey, we've got this data set. Here's a couple of rows. Do we think a very smart domain expert could take this row and make the, the right conclusion? If yes, then there's probably a good algorithm that could do the same. If not, well, what would it take to enable that human to do it? So if you can get to that stage where you think you have the right data sets, where smart people looking at the data can give you the answer you want, then you're probably in some business. The next question you should ask yourself is, do I really need an algorithm to do this? So maybe you want to fully automate this process, in which case the answer is, yeah, okay, if, they, if a human can look at this data and come up with a conclusion, then I can certainly automate that. And automation by itself is an interesting enough thing that I'm going to go after it. That means the end user is making lots of decisions per day, and there's some chance of fatigue or, or whatever. It's wasting their time, so if you automate it, it would be great. So that's one, you know, one way to say that that's valuable. Second is you could say, not only could the human make this decision, we know that the human would have to make too many decisions during a day, so we can increase their capacity by doing this in an automated way. Or there's even more data out there that we think would leverage better solution to this problem that the human can't look at. So for example, it could be lots of context. So other things that are around if the, the image is moving and there's lots of subframes, or if there's a lot of, of audio in there that is you know, not easy to hear, but a computer might be able to pick out, a machine might be able to pick out some of the noises from, then that's another good reason to try because you might be able to improve over the accuracy of the human. Or you know, th that a human will make this decision, but they're only making the decision based on their limited experience. They can make this decision off the data, but we know we have a lot more training examples out there, so we could probably get better accuracy. So I think any of those are good reasons to believe that a simple MVP, which you could define by, could a human make this decision pretty well, would work. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but that's, that's pretty interesting. So, so you'd be trying to find a model, you'd be thinking about models and, and maybe the data required or available based on understanding like the human workflow or what's, what, how the human is going about saying, is it a cat or not? Something like that. If you could prove to me that with this set of data, a human could make a decision that's right, and we've got that data, then these days, I think your, your algorithm has a good shot of reproducing the human's accuracy levels, if not exceeding them. So then the question is, you know, what does the business really care about? Do they want a better cat classifier or do they want a faster cat classifier? And there's lots of reasons to believe the machine could do better. Now, there are going to be some problems where even if you showed the data to a human, they're going to have a hard time picking out what's going on, thinking about security logs here, right? If somebody showed you a bunch of IP accesses for a web server and some, you know, HTTP gets and, and things like that, a human might not really be able to look through that and figure out what's going on, but maybe a machine would. So it's not a foolproof way of defining whether this is a, a good path to an MVP or not, but it's a, it's a good enough approximation for a lot of problems, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And in, in the same way with our, you know, our music project, I think why I got pretty excited about our conversation is you sort of gave me the input, this real book input. If a bunch of humans took a look at that real book input, they would be able to play a pretty good interpretation of a song. So now the question is, can we, starting with that same input, can we train a machine so it could do the, so it could do a similar thing? So we know that a real book input with a trained musician is enough to produce something awesome. Theoretically, then it's like, if you have the data, then you can, you can get a machine to do it as well. Exactly. Well, and, that, and that's the question, right? So right. now I think at least we have a good framework for something that I expect an algorithm to be able to do in that framework that I gave you. Are there other examples you've worked on that are similar? Like, so some of the challenges with that, that project were or will be, you have data in the form of the real book, which is intellectual property, right? It's, it's, and I'm not talking about legal issues. I'm talking about it's IP of the song. It's not the audio, right? It's, it's the embodiment of the song uh, in, in ink. It's not a full rendering of like an orchestral score, which is effectively almost all of the code 
to play a symphony. It's all written down. Now, obviously, there's, there's stuff that's not on the page that's interpretation and phrasing and some of this, but it's, there's a lot more data there than there is in the real book. Are there business problems you've worked on where there's a similar thing where you have a kind of a, an approximation of something like that? Or maybe you have the aggregate. When we were talking about this as well, we were kind of separating out the song IP, the, the, the actual printed real book scores from the audio, which is a completely different thing, right? And that audio is the sum of all the sound created by all of the musicians. It's not multi-track audio with each, you know, it's not like a MIDI recording where, you know, piano, bass, drums, it's all separated, it's all digital. It's actually just one big stereo mix. Are there like parallels to that that you deal with, that you've dealt with? And do, do you think about it from a business standpoint, like a business problem you've had in the past? Like, are they totally different beasts? Yeah, no, I think that that is a very common a very common occurrence. So in the example in that framework I was giving you before about if you showed this data to a smart domain expert, could they come up with, with what it means? Think about healthcare data records where you have all this, you know, you might have an EMR in set of information. So this is the electronic medical record, which is a little bit complete. You might just have a picture of, of claims data passing through. So the claims data is meant for the insurance company to be able to decide how much to charge folks. Or maybe you just have the what drug was prescribed. Maybe you get it from a pharmacy. So each of those, I think, would be very small and incomplete windows on a larger problem of what happened in this patient-physician interaction. So there might be a smaller question you could ask, which is, how much does somebody on average pay for medication? How often do they pick up their medication from the CVS? You know, some of that data might be more relevant directly related to that question, but the broader, messier question of what happened in this patient-physician interaction, imagine somebody was recording a patient-physician interaction, and you wanted to reproduce that from just the EMR or the claims data, that would probably be pretty tough to do, right? I can imagine giving the claims data to a doctor and they're saying, well, that's just not enough information for me to have any sense of what happened in this interaction. So I think it's sort of similar in that way. And one of the things that comes out of that, that way of thinking about it is sometimes data is good enough to answer a question, but it's a narrow question. And if you try to broaden the question, the data becomes incomplete, noisy, et cetera. So you've got to think about what the data is capturing and if it's relevant to the question you're really trying to answer. Do you go into the projects like, if you're, so if you're working, you know, you're working in a company or something like that, do you look at the projects as primarily either being in the mode of, we're in lab research mode here, which is maybe we're looking for a problem to solve with the data we have. So it's kind of data first, problem second. And then there's projects that are problem first, data second, and everything kind of falls into one of those two more or less. Are, are there, is it binary? Is that not how you think of it? Is it trinary? Is there... Can you talk to me a little bit about that kind of lab mentality versus, you know, the research kind of side? The problem versus, mentality? Yeah. Like, do you, do you think of it that way? I think everything, you know, it's sort of a grayscale and you're somewhere in the middle. Maybe there's a third point out there. So it's a little more complicated than that. But those are, those are two poles of things. So there's either, it, I, I think it's extremely rare to have somebody just say, hey, we've got this data. What can you do with it? It's, it's rare for somebody to say, you know, we want to poke around with this data from an algorithmic perspective today, but we have no idea what it's good for. You're probably more on that side, especially today. You have people that they'll focus their their questions more on the data strategy. We've got this data. Is there anybody in the market that's interested in some kind of derivative of this data? And then it becomes sort of a market research exercise. And then on the other side from the data science perspective, you've got hey, we've got this problem, our accuracy is at 89.34%. We want it to be at 89.44%. Can you help us with that? So that's also a very rare place, even though you know, I think people are, are conditioned to believe that it's more common than not because of things like Kaggle. So I, I think the truth is usually somewhere in between. And if a business has really defined a problem very well, you know, they're probably doing a good job of focusing resources on it. The truth is, they probably have an idea that they could be doing something better. They've seen some market demand for it. They need some help putting the pieces together. And that help could involve, uh, is basically a, a data science MVP, right? They 
want to take this data with some algorithm to see if it's going to be useful to tackle that problem. Or we've been using this algorithm on this data to solve this problem. We think there might be better methods. And one of the reasons we believe that is because there's this new data set we've been sitting on that we haven't been able to use. So what method would now incorporate this data in solving this problem? Those are the situations, I think, where you get a big shift in value. Are there things that business stakeholders and designers and user experience people can do to facilitate the process of working uh, with data scientists, especially like with, again, if in the decision support tool kind of in that space, is there, is there a way to optimize the work that you guys do or to make it easier, like just to get better value, to do it more quickly? Have you learned what not to do with that? Or have you seen processes that didn't work so well that you, you're like, I don't think that's the way to do it? I think I have a perspective on both sides. So when we were really early at Level Trigger, we were talking to a design firm. You know, we, we kind of had a half-baked idea about using location data to help retailers. And walking into the design firm, I think we had no idea what the workflow should be. And that really was some trouble. So I think if you're on the data-driven insight side of the fence, you've got to do a lot of exploration or have some idea of what the workflow is before you bring in designers or or UI folks. And that, that may mean the first person you need to talk to is some domain experts who are going to tell you how this data would or would not be used. So I think it's better to have as much of a sense of the workflow that you're both trying to improve before you really can start collaborating. On the designer UI side, I think it's extremely important, if you can, to give the data team, whether from the ingest side or on the the modeling side, as much insight as possible into how it's going to be used, how their outputs will be used. Because there are folks over there who will have new ideas, and they're likely to have more targeted new ideas, or even do a better job on the idea you already agree on if they understand how it will be used. And similarly, I think the designers and UI folks should very much demand and expect to understand how the data science team is putting together their outputs. If the design and UI folks don't understand that, can't come up with a way to represent it, you can give all the decision support you want, but you're not going to do it in a convincing way to an end user who is trying to, who you want to hope to adopt this. So I think there needs to be a lot of transparency there, both how and why does this work? And then how and why is it, how, how is it going to be used? That's helpful for both sides. So I want to unpack the, the first part of what you said. So for me, when I, when I think about design, like workflow is a core concept to me of, of design. So whoever does it or whatever title it is, you know, that doesn't matter. But I'm, I'm curious what didn't go so well. So you said you walked in the door. Was that firm more of like a UI design kind of place where they're focused on ink and pixels and not so much on workflow? And it was just like the wrong match? Because I, I would have think that they would have started with a problem space, use cases, even theoretical ones that need to go out and, and then be validated if they if they don't start at the customer and instead start with, you know, maybe you guys as a horse, you know, proxy for for the actual users and you go out and try to validate that those problems actually exist. Did they just was that just not their competency? Or like tell me about that the gap. Yeah, I, I think we were just too early to leverage their their capabilities. They were a little more downstream. We really needed somebody to, to help work with us to validate how this would be used. And I think they were really looking for somebody, you know, their, their sweet spot was more, once somebody understands how this process is going to be used, we're going to help you convert it into a set of mock-ups that we can then implement together. There's a lot of different designers out there. There's a lot sure. of different parts of the process, you know, some that can serve as project managers to implementation, some that are just implementation, some that are really, you know, can build the fastest, smoothest design, some that can mock up the best designs, and some that are really sort of more product manager market research if they have experience in a given domain. I think understanding where you are as a business when you start doing some machine learning initiatives is pretty, is pretty important. I fully agree. Like where, again, regardless of who the, you know, the consultant or vendor or designer, whoever you work with, the point is that that activity needed to happen. I think we both agree as a a designer looking at the problem, user experience professional, and as you as a data scientist looking at it, 
the theme here, I think, for the listeners is that you do need to understand this this workflow. Whoever is going to go out and do that research or discovery that needs to happen, because it's going to feed everything downstream and it's going to prevent wasting time and you know building the wrong stuff, spending money yeah, on things building. that don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, and and that's a you know I think the maybe the data scientist believes, hey, if I don't have that right, then we're just going to build the wrong the wrong workflow. But the modeling is still going to be good. The data pipeline is going to still be good. The answer is no, right? If there isn't, if you don't have the right workflow in mind as you're building the data ingest and the data model and the, and the algorithms, when you do figure out the right workflow, those things are probably going to change too. So you know, you need you need to have an agile approach across the board for all. Any other uh, lessons learned from your experience? Uh, I, again, faci- make, kind of in that theme of facilitating the the data science activities with product management and and user experience design. Any, any other thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think the if it's worth a, a little bit more conversation, the other point, you know, coming upstream or downstream, whatever perspective we're at, the UI folks, the designers, the workflow, they should be able to understand why the algorithm is working. Why is this thing giving us answers in the first place? What are the inputs we're getting into it? How do we expect them to change? Those are I think savvy end users, they want to trust the system. If you're successful, I've seen end users like most of us with Google and Google Maps. Now we don't really worry about what they're doing. But when we first start with products like that, especially in a B2B context, we want to know if we can trust the answers that we're about to act on. So there needs to be some transparency in the process. And really good designers and analytics folks will give just the right level of a peek behind the curtain to give everybody some trust. And that's got to start with, I think, the data and the data science team and the ML team being able to explain what they're doing to the designers, product managers, et cetera. I think that's good advice. I fully agree. And I've, you know, when I've worked on some products that do, you know, root cause analysis or exception, you know, detecting exceptions, you know, in systems, it's, Customers really want the conclusion first, but especially a technical user. Like if if you're if you're designing for a technical user, they also want some evidence. But at least in my research in a in a particular space with IT software, they don't really want all the data. They just want to know that the system that somebody looked at the data and that there's some sub substantiation behind the conclusion. Exactly. And over time, I think they stop kind of really looking into the weeds because they start to trust the conclusions the systems are made because they can see it. So as you said, it's kind of like this line, like where do you draw the line between what you're going to put in the UI and not put in the, what, like what's too much <laughs> and what's just enough? And, and you're right, that's a, that's a design challenge and it, you got to talk to people and, and get stuff in front of customers to kind of figure out where that fine line is. And on the data science side, right, if the front end people are telling me or the workflow managers, the designers are telling me that the users want to get some trust in the system first, then maybe instead of a a model that gives us no transparency into why we're making the predictions we make, maybe I need to choose a slightly less successful model that can give me that transparency because it means it'll be adopted more. Or maybe I need to wrap my understanding of the algorithm in some high-level statistics the designer feels can give out a feeling of trust to the user. So there's lots of good reasons to do that. And another reason, and we've seen this a lot, sometimes you make predictions and they're wrong and there's nothing you could do about it. So you need to have a, depending on the use case and the workflow, you may need to have an end user override function where they can come in and say, yeah, I know you told me to go turn off this server, but actually it's fine. You're probably missing some signal So either I'm going to drop your system now entirely because I don't like it because of that one bad recommendation or give me a way to let you know that that was wrong and then build a model that uses that as further training so that doesn't happen again. So if you're going to solicit feedback from the user to override a problem, you know, a false positive, that's really valuable feedback to get from the user and you better take advantage of it. So you better build a pipeline that can actually use that bit of information to ensure that you never show a similar false positive. Yeah, you said some great things in there. Like, I totally agree with feedback. And I, I would, I guess I'd put out a broad recommendation too that like, 
even if that feedback is not like if it's qualitative, it's a fill out a form and like leave a comment on this prediction or something. And it's just an email that gets out. The point is to start collecting the feedback, not it doesn't need to be highly technical and like, you know, rank, ranked choice and all this kind of stuff. It's just about understanding what you don't even know you don't know about and getting just getting informed about that. So I, I love the active way to do that and the passive, passive meaning you're not going out and doing research, but the, the tool has some embedded feedback mechanism. There's so many great Even better. Yeah. tools these days to like leave a message in the chat window. You know, like almost every SaaS I use now uses Drift or some similar plugin. And we, watch you, we, we watch you go to the second page of search results instead of hitting the first page. That's a great passive response that you're not seeing what you want. I also like, I love what you said. I, I hadn't really thought about that. And this is, this is something I think is worth repeating. And, and maybe if I got this right, and I think you said, maybe you might sacrifice model quality. Like I'm going to downgrade the model we're using to upgrade the transparency that we gave because adoption and engagement by the user will go up. And if, if you're using commercial software, that might directly translate to people that don't, you know, there's no attrition, attrition goes down, right? People are remaining subscribers every month because they trust the system. And maybe the reality is, is you could do better predictions with a different model, but you would lose some of that, the trust. Is, is that kind of what you said? That's right. There's a, a couple of points on that. So first, I think even as the modeler in an internal perspective, I like to first start with models that I can really interrogate. So linear regression is really great because you can see what the coefficients are. I'm definitely not going to give you the best accuracy, but that or a decision tree, like you're going to understand why it's doing what it's doing. And that's a really, it's so easy to screw up your data pipeline and come up with nonsense and then chase tails for a long time figuring it out. So, you know, part of the reason I'm a little bit stuck on this music project is because I think I've got some data normalization issues and my model wasn't giving me the feedback on that. So you even want to have different models as you're starting internally so you can understand what's going on. From a cold-blooded flat point of view, if your model is slightly less accurate but it increases end user adoption because they also have some transparency, then you'll have wider adoption. That might lead to more training sets, which could end up improving your overall product accuracy even more. I have a good friend that used to work in the fintech world, and they were buyers of fraud algorithmic software. So, you know, they were processing lots of transaction data, and you could buy commodity fraud algorithms from various providers to help determine whether this transaction was fraudulent or not before you decided to process it. And what he told me is that there was a wide variety, there was a wide range of accuracies across those algorithms. Some of the algorithms were 5% more effective than some of the other algorithms. And I was like, well, that's crazy. Why wouldn't you just buy the one that has the highest accuracy all the time? He said it was because no matter what algorithm they bought, it was never going to be more than 90% accurate at the time. And they knew that if they rejected a transaction, they were going to have to get on the phone with somebody and explain why they rejected it. So they ended up purchasing using vendors that made that process easy. They got that workflow right. Everybody's going to make mistakes. And you didn't care if there was an extra two or three mistakes a day, as long as you had a better workflow for resolving them. So it's, a, it's an example of sometimes accuracy isn't the most important thing you should be optimizing for. It's the rest of the package. How do you correct? How do you deal with an error that inevitably occurs? If you can make that a good process, then I think you're, you're more on the road to making users happy than trying to live in this idealized world where you never make a mistake at all. I think it's great advice whether uh, for both you know, any data scientists that are, that are listening that perhaps have a little uh, more of a bent to do really good research and do high quality modeling is to think about that, you know, maybe I down, I take a hit on the model stuff. I, maybe I won't feel as good about pushing out something that's not as accurate, but you'll, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're changing someone's life or you're impacting the business. And maybe you're going to build more <laughs> revenue and income, which what might allow you to then go do better work down, you know, like and reinvest in, in the platform that you're building. So you can, there could still be a win as you said, you know, maybe your training data grows. And so you, you can still win by taking a, a quality hit at the beginning. 
you can always recover the quality hit later, right? right. I think it's just, it's just a question of what you want to learn about first. I'm not, I'm not saying choose a linear regression model always. Yeah, deep learning models are great. You can get really high accuracy with them. But, you know, when you're learning, sometimes there's more important things than the highest accuracy, especially if each one of your end users is very valuable to you. Cool. That's good stuff, man. I, this has been a really good conversation. Do you have any, do you have any other uh, like parting words or advice for, you know, data product managers or kind of analytics leaders, people living in this space that they might be able to take away uh, from your experience? No, I, th I think we, we covered a, we covered a lot there. There's probably a, a lot of garbage in there, but hopefully some of it was useful. <laughs> no, I, this is a, this is a really good conversation and I, I hope, hope people got a lot out of it. So tell us, Puneet, where, uh, I've been talking to Puneet Batra again, data scientist. Where can people uh, find out about you? Are you, are you on the interwebs, Twitter, any of those places? I'm on Twitter's at GP Batra and uh, LinkedIn is another good place. So look me up in either of those and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to people. Cool. I will uh, put those in the show notes. Yeah, maybe we'll uh, get a chance to sync up down the road a little bit if, if uh, this little music project uh, you're working on goes somewhere and we can talk about uh, creativity. I'll actually make it useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, thanks again. Right. And uh, I hope to uh, see you soon. Okay, bye. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.